Man, I am so excited you are here today, and I'm pumped to be here. First off, if you're new, let me introduce myself. My name is Mike. I have the wonderful honor of being the lead pastor here. I'm so blessed you're here. You could be anywhere. The fact that you're here means the world to us. Also excited about everybody watching online and our family out at Forsyth. Can everybody help me welcome everybody out of Forsyth? What's up, Forsyth? And look at good. Got a new shirt. I'm liking it. I'm liking it. All right, guys. I am pumped. I'm going to dive right into the message today. We are kicking off a brand new series called The Blessed Life. And if you were online at all this week, I told you, you need to be here today uh, to kick off this series. It's something I really felt in my heart. People need to be at this series. Now, I don't do that a lot. So when I do it, I just want to make sure it's because it's going to count. So I'm going to use my car when I need to use it. But I based this series around a book with the same name, written by a pastor named Robert Morris. This is a, a message. This is a series. This is a mentality and principles that have literally changed my life and impacted my life for the last almost 20 years since I read it way back in college back in the day. And this is also something I feel like is what a lot of people are missing, and then they're not seeing what God's wanting to do in and through their lives. And I've never taught this to this depth or this placement before, so we're going to go there over the next several weeks. So I feel like some bondages are going to be free. I feel like some blessings are going to happen. I feel like you're going to start walking in something God has always intended you walk in. So i got another challenge for you. Don't miss a week. I want you to hear the whole series. And I know in 2019, going to church every single week is a crazy concept, right? Like, oh my goodness, we're so busy, Pastor Mike. It shouldn't be, but it is. Let's make the commitment we're going to be here because I want to see all that God has for you as we start understanding this heart and the principles of generosity that God has for us. And so if you are here and you got your notes, pull them out because who takes notes? The holy people take notes. All right. And we're going to dive right into this. Right, right. We're going to look at what David says right here at Psalms 106. Check this out. Blessed are those who act justly, who always do what is right. And notice what he's saying here. And if you look at this, the deeper meaning is this. He's saying, blessed are those who act justly towards others and who do what is right towards others. And this word blessed that he uses right here is actually the root word. It actually means you are filled with joy or filled with happiness. So he says, those that are happy and filled with joy act justly towards other people and always do what is right towards other people. That's what he says in verse 3. Now let's watch what he says in verse 4 and 5. Watch this. Check this out. Remember me, Lord, when you show favor to your people. Come to my aid when you save them that I may enjoy in the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may share in the joy of your nation and join in your inheritance in giving praise. I want you to see what David's doing right here. David is saying something really powerful. He starts off with verse 3, and he starts saying, I need to get my heart right. I got to get my heart aligned with God's character and God's ways that I need to understand that I've got to be motivated to treat other people in a way that is selfless so that I care about their well-being. He says, and I need to get my heart right before I ever understand the blessings of God. So in verse 3, he says, I'm getting my heart right. And in verse 4 and 5, he starts talking about the blessings of God because he says, when my heart's right, I know what to do with the blessings of God. That I don't receive the blessings of God for selfish gain, I receive the blessings of God so that I can be a gracious blessing to someone else. I'm going to react the way God has created me and ordained me to react. That is the same message Jesus echoed when he walked on this earth. And Luke reminds us of this message in Acts. Watch what Luke says. Watch this. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus because we don't always remember them. We might know it by memory, but we don't always act this way. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. How many people know that's not always the way we feel, though? How many people know sometimes we get in our mind it's better to receive than it is to give? Because inherently what we think at the core of who we are is that blessings come when we get that raise, when we get that bonus, when we get that gift, 
when we get those accolades, when we get that affirmation. And Jesus is saying something completely different here. Jesus says, you want joy, you want happiness, you want to be fulfilled, you need to understand the art of giving and being generous. And not only will you walk in a blessing, you're going to walk in a blessed life when this becomes your lifestyle choice because it will impact every part of your life. You will walk in a blessed marriage because what does a thriving marriage have? It has spouses that are generous towards each other. You're going to walk blessed in your workplace because how do you know when you're blessed in your work? Not because you can climb the ladder by yourself, but because you help everybody around you be the best version of who they are. Because when the organization wins, you win. You're going to see blessings in your friendships. Because who wants to be a friend with a selfish person that only thinks about themselves? But people are attracted to someone that's selfless and cares about people. You're going to see blessings in your purpose because you're going to start living for a life bigger than yourself. And then it's going to shift in your understandings. So you're going to have a blessed life, not just a blessed pocketbook. Because I know a lot of people got a blessed pocketbook, but they don't got a blessed life. And he says, I want you to have blessings in every aspect of your life. So for thousands of years, the Word of God has been talking about how happiness and joy is rooted in generosity. It's rooted in a generous lifestyle. And this is not just some ancient proverb that sounds cliche and sounds good. Because studies even today are starting to find that it's true. Psychologists and all their studies are starting to find that a person that walks in a generous lifestyle, it triggers chemicals in their brain that is a mood booster that causes joy in their life, that causes optimism in their life, and causes fulfillment in their life. So the Word of God has been proclaiming what God wired our bodies and our minds to live in. We are wired and created to be generous, not selfish. But our flesh and our sin will. Why do you think the devil works so hard to keep you from being generous? Because he understands it will literally change every aspect of your life. And he does not want you walking in fulfillment. He wants you walking in desperation. He wants you surviving, not thriving. He wants you never satisfied and always coveting and wanting more. So we're going to learn the art of this today, and I'm just setting the foundation. And over the next several weeks, I'm going to really get in depth. So I'm going to get my teach on over the next several weeks. So I need you with me, all right? But I want to start with this principle that Jesus kind of lays out there. And it's actually a principle you'll find in several of the Gospels. And we're going to look at two of the Gospels today. We're going to start with Matthew. Watch what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7. Luke repeats this exact same thing, but Luke adds a little bit more details in the middle. Watch what Luke says. Do not judge and you will not, and you will not be judged. Remember, that's the beginning of what Matthew said. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Watch what he goes on to say. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap for the measure you use. Remember, that's what, how Matthew ended. It will be measured to you. Now, I'm asking you a question. Is money mentioned at all? In Matthew? Nope. In Luke, not at all. Why is that? Because giving is much more about being generous with every aspect of your life, not just money. Money's a part of it, but it's only a part of it. And you've got to understand getting the heart right. You got to understand that this is why we've got to get this framed right with our heart in the foundation of this. It's why I titled the message, What's in Your Heart? Because if we don't answer that question correctly, we're going to miss all the things that God's trying to teach us and miss the happiness and the joy He's trying to get us to live. Jesus makes a statement one chapter before in Matthew chapter 6. Watch this. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. We always read this scripture wrong. We always think that we make our decisions based on our emotions. That's not what he's saying here. 
He's saying you make the decisions despite what you feel. That your actions should be right no matter what your feelings are in the moment, you're going to do the right thing no matter what. Because if you do the right thing, if you place your treasure in the right place, sooner or later your desires, your emotions, and your heart's going to line up with the person God wants you to be. But that's not necessarily the way we feel, and it's not what culture teaches us, right? What's culture say? Do what makes you feel happy. You're the master of you. You do you, boo. Do whatever you feel like, despite what other people say and despite whatever God tells you. You got to do what's in your emotional state. But Jesus is saying we are not slaves to our emotions. We are servants to God. And that I'm going to die to my flesh, what I feel in the moment, so that my spirit can come alive, the person God created me to be, even if I don't feel like it in the moment. But over time, my heart will align with the person God created me to be. My passions will rise the way I was created to be. And in this place, I'm not going to have temporary happiness. I'm going to walk in joy and the blessings of God. You got to get it deep in your spirit what God's trying to get aligned in your heart and mind. All right, let's go back to Luke and look at this again. So what's he say? Do not judge and, it will, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Watch what he goes on to say. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. So what's Jesus saying here? He says if you give condemnation, if you give judgment, you're getting it back. If you give forgiveness, you're getting that back. He's saying whatever you give, you're going to get back in return. It's called the law of reaping and sowing. And this law literally impacts every part of your life. I'm a dad. I got children. How many of y'all know that? But as a father, I understand my hierarchy placement in our parental authority. My wife is ahead of me in a lot of the decisions when it comes to our kids. And one of those is what and when our children eat. I let her kind of steer the ship in that. And so for years, my kids will come up to me and they'll ask me if they can eat something. And men sentence, they'll say, oh, yeah, that's a mom question. And then they'll go find their mother. Because for years, I'll say, go ask your mom. That's a mom question. Right? I've been, I've been handing them out. Go to your dietitian, i.e. the boss, and get your permission. All right? Because I'm not going to get in trouble. <laughs> well, just this week, we sitting in the living room with one of my sons, and there's a bag of chocolate chips sitting on the coffee table. And my son, who hasn't eaten dinner yet, asked, can I have some of these? And I told him no. And then he looks at me and goes, isn't that mom's decision, not yours? <laughs> can you believe homeboy had that audacious faith to speak that way to me? But I've been reaping what I've sowing, right? Come on. Because I've been deflecting the mama all these years. It came back and bit me in the booty. <laughs> you're going to reap what you sow. And you're going to get back. And no matter what in area aspect of it. And watch how you get back. What's he say? He says, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It'll be poured into your lap. And what he's referencing here is a farming term. In the Old Testament, and in, the, and in these days, when the people of Israel would have a farm, they would never harvest the outside edges because they would leave those edges for the poor people. And so there was always two types of harvesters in the fields. There were those that were hired by the landowner who would go to the middle of the field, and their job was to take the grain that was in the middle of the field and take it to the wagons and carts. And they were usually paid by the day. They weren't paid by how much they put in a basket. They were paid by just carrying the thing all day long, back and forth, back and forth. However, the people on the edge of the field had a different philosophy and mentality. Because many of them woke, walked miles from their homes to come to this field. So when they was filling a basket, 
They were making sure that bad boy was filled to the top as full as they can get because they ain't making several trips back and forth. So what they would do is they would fill it up to about halfway and then they would shake it and they would stamp it down and they would get all the air out and let all the grain settle so then it would drop to a lower level. They'd fill it back up and then they'd shake it, pat it down, shake it, and they'd keep doing it till it started pouring over so full. So when they brought that bad boy back, mama was happy. Because here's what I know. It's one thing to receive a free basket of grain. It's another thing to receive a free basket of grain that's pressed down, shaken, that is spilling over in your lap. And God wants you to be blessed. And God wants you to be fulfilled. And God wants joy penetrating every part of your life. But you got to make sure your heart's right. Because we got to understand the godly, generous heart that we're supposed to have. Because too many times we look at this and we go at it with the wrong heart mentality. So here's what I wanna do. I want to talk about how to develop a generous heart. How do we develop a heart of generosity? How do we get this in our heart, in our spirit? And we're gonna kind of park at Deuteronomy chapter 15, because God really kind of lays out for the people of Israel, the children of God, what it looks like to be generous. Watch what he says, starting in verse seven, watch this. But if there are any poor Israelites in your towns, when you arrive in the land the Lord your God has given you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted. How many times that tends to be us a lot of ways? Man, we, we harden our hearts. Man, I ain't giving nothing, right? I'm not compelled by that. Nope, nope. And then what do we do? We hold on tight with our things. Right? That's my money, right? That's my stuff. That's my blessing. I ain't giving that to nobody, right? And he says, no, nah, don't do that. Instead, be what? Generous and lend them whatever they need. And then over the next several verses, he talks to us about four things we need to get in our spirits. The first is this. We got to deal with the selfish heart. We got to deal with the selfishness that's deep inside of us. We got to deal what's going on on the inside. Watch what he says in verse 9. Don't be mean-spirited and refuse someone alone because the year of canceling debts is close at hand. If you refuse to make the loan and the needy person cries out to the Lord, you will be considered guilty of sin. Other translations say it like this. Don't get this wicked thought, I ain't going to give somebody a loan. I ain't going to help somebody out because they might not pay me back before the time of canceling of debts happens. And what he's referencing here is something very important. God is saying that selfishness is wickedness in God's eyes. And it is guilty of sin. And what he's referencing about the year of canceling debt is God had a very specific economic system in these days. Every seven years, if you had debt, it was completely wiped clean. You are debt free. They called it the year of Jubilee because that is something to be Jubilee about, right? Come on. All your debt's gone. How many people like that today? It's called bankruptcy, but it doesn't work in the same way, okay? <laughs> doesn't work the same, right? Back then, that was the way it worked. And so what he's saying here is don't get this wicked thought that I don't want to help someone out because Jubilee's coming, and if they don't pay me back, I ain't getting back mine. He's saying because that selfishness will lead to wickedness and that wickedness will cause you to sin. And we are children of God. We're motivated by something different. We look different and we have to feel different. And that's why you've got to ask the question, why did God invent giving? Listen to me. Do you think God needs your money? You think the creator of the universe... The all-powerful God needs your money so he can accomplish his work. God did not invent giving for his sake. God invented giving for our sake. Why? Because giving over any other activity works selfishness and greed out of our hearts. And he wants you to walk not in sin but in freedom. This is why I cringe a lot when I hear pastors or churches teach on giving. 
Because I hear a lot of pastors and churches teaching that if you give, you're going to get more back in return. That doesn't drive selfishness and greed out of your heart. It drives it into your heart. It drives it deeper into your heart that if you give to God, he's going to give you even more. How do you think God feels if his children, if his people are only motivated by giving because they bought into this idea, this get rich quick scheme idea that if I give to the kingdom of God, I'm going to be rich in return. How do you think that motivates God? How do you think God enjoys that, right? Do you think God's just like, man, I hope my people catch the vision of giving so they can get more stuff. Right? That's like being married to somebody for their money. I don't love you. I just love the lifestyle you can give me. It's like being a parent and your kid's saying, I only want to spend time with you if you buy me something. Does that feel good? But that's the way we look at it. And what he's saying is you got to shift your motivation and shift the way you see things because we're trying to drive sin out of our heart and wickedness out of our heart because we want to walk in the freedom and the fullness of an empty vessel so God can pour himself into me. That's why Proverbs says people may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines the what? Motives. You can do all the right things for the wrong reasons. James says it like this, when you ask, don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. You got to get your heart right. And we are giving so we can deal with a selfish heart. The second thing you got to learn is this, we got to deal with a grieving heart. We got to deal with a grieving heart. Watch what it says in Deuteronomy. Give generously to the poor. Not grudgingly, for the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. Does anybody got $100 I can borrow? You got a $100 bill? You got Give me a $100 bill. Come on. Thanks, my man. You can have a seat. All right. It's a good man, right? Here's what I know. Selfishness hits you before you give. Grieving hits you after you give. Have you ever help someone out, or you gave a generous gift, and then maybe something broke that you owned, or you had a financial problem arise, or all of a sudden, the moment you gave that money, you had this anxiety rise up. Oh my gosh, what if, what if something happens? Or well, maybe I shouldn't have let that money. It's not that you didn't want to bless that person, but you started panicking. What if I need that coming up, right? Have you ever done that, right? Because the devil likes to hit you right there with that grief. The devil likes to hit you in this area of saying, you shouldn't have done that. You're going to regret that. Why does the devil hit you with grief after you give? Because he doesn't want you to understand that God will bless you in everything you do. He wants you to think you bless you in everything you do. You are the God in your life. You are your provider in your life. And you got to protect yourself, not trust God, and to be the person God created you to be. So the question you got to ask yourself is this. How do you combat grief? How do we get over this grief that we feel sometimes when we give? And this is it. Write this in your notes. You have the proper perspective regarding your money. You got to have the proper perspective regarding your money. Now, some of y'all are probably still thinking, why did I take Tyler's $100 bill and shove it in my pocket? And why is Tyler not freaking out right now that somebody took his money and didn't tell him why and just told him to sit back down? Because in a normal situation, if somebody gets money from you and don't tell you why and sit back down, you're going to be freaking out. You'll be grieving. I'm going to give you some insider info. That ain't Tyler's $100 bill. That was my $100 bill. I gave it to him before church. <laughs> and I told him, at point two, I'm going to ask you to come up and give it to me. Tyler ain't grieving because Tyler knew it was my money to begin with. Tyler ain't grieving and freaking out because he's just giving me back what's already mine. The reason why, you know where I'm going with this, come on. The reason why a lot of times we struggle with giving is because we got stewardship all mixed up. We still think we're the gods. We think we're the owners. 
We think we're the providers. And we fail to remember we're living in the land God gave us. We're living in the blessings God gave us. We're walking in what God has given us. So when we give back, give out of generosity, we're just giving God what's already his. And we're reshaping the way we think about our money. I don't grieve something that I lost something because I never had it in the beginning. I was just stewarding it and giving it back to God. So I'm going to deal with a selfish heart. I'm going to deal with a grieving heart. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to develop a generous heart. We're going to develop a generous heart. Watch what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 14. Watch this. Give him a generous farewell gift from your flock. Your threshing floor and your wine press. Share with him some of the, how much? Bounty with which the Lord your God has blessed you. How many people know we're born selfish? You don't believe me? It's because you ain't a parent. What do you got to teach your kids? To share, right? What do your kids always want? What the other kid has, right? What's one of the very first things your kids learn to say? Mine, right? Mine. My boys spend 80% of their time fighting over what the other one has. I want it. Hey, my, he did, we got. That's why, man, I just is a battle royale downstairs, always over the other person's toy. Right? We born selfish, but we're born again generous. We're born selfish, but we're born again generous. So how do you walk in generosity? How do you get it deep in your spirit? By renewing our minds. I gotta change the way I view wins in this world. I gotta change the way I view success in this world. I gotta quit looking at this world through the lens of, of this world and look at it through the lens of heaven. Watch what Paul says. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing what? The way you think. Every time you start reading that God's teaching about generosity, it's almost like he's telling his people, when are you gonna grow up? When are you going to grow up and change the way you think? Because right now, I'm still having to teach you to be generous and share with others. Right now, you always want what someone else has. Right now, you've got the mind mentality. It's all about me mentality. And when are you going to start acting like your father who loved you so much he gave? He didn't love you so much he took. He loved you so much he gave his one and only son. And we call to be imitators of Christ, not imitators of this world. We call to be ambassadors of heaven, not ambassadors of this world. We're called to look different. We're called to act different. We're called to look at wins differently and success differently and joy differently and fulfillment differently. I'm changing the way I think. I'm changing the game, amen? <laughs> Motivated by different things. Which leads lastly, we got to develop a grateful heart. We got to develop a grateful heart. Watch what verse 15 says. Ah, remember that you were once slaves in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I'm giving you this command. You see that? He starts saying, I'm giving you the command of being generous. Because you got to remember where you came from. You were a slave. You were broken. You were heading for death. And God redeemed you. We can't ever get over being saved. We can't ever get over our redemption. If my past never met my Savior, I would have no right to stand on this stage. If you knew the way I was raised, if you knew the choices I made, if you knew the way I treated other people, if you knew the mistakes I partook in, if you knew what selfishness motivated me, my past would have disqualified me again and again and again, but God, God got a hold of my life. God redeemed me. God took my sins and covered it with the blood of Jesus and washed me clean. And he called me his child. 
He called me chosen. He called me forgiven. He called me with a purpose. And he rose me up. And he did the same thing with you. You've been redeemed. You once were a slave. You once were broken. And now you are resurrected children of God. Come on. Generosity is just the overflow of a grateful heart. I can't outgive my God, but God, you got everything I got. Got everything I got. That's why I love what Peter says, live each day with holy awe and reverence throughout your time on this earth. Why? For you know that your lives were ransomed once and for all from the empty and futile way of life handed down from the generation to generation. So you once had death just always being in your life, but it's not a ransom payment of silver or gold which eventually perishes, but the precious blood of Christ, who like a spotless, unblemished lamb, was sacrificed for you. He paid the greatest price for you. And that's why we walk in joy, because we don't live motivated by this world. We live motivated by heaven. And a lot of you have forgot that you were saved. A lot of you have forgotten how far you've come. And that's why you keep thinking the world will fulfill you. And you forgot it's only heaven that can fill your heart. But I'm gonna be honest with you, there's some people in this room right now that have not had their sins paid for. You haven't had God get a hold of your heart. You haven't had him forgive everything you've done. You haven't walked in that freedom. You're still walking like a slave in this world because you don't have a relationship with your Jesus. Maybe you never have. Maybe you've never experienced it or experienced church like this or, or read the word of God. Maybe it's never been real to you. Or maybe you have in the past, but you've walked away. And you know when you look at your heart and your life, you're not living a life pleasing to God that you chose to walk away from that grace and live however the heck you want. But your God is saying, it's time to come back home. Your God's saying, I've got a plan for you. Your God's saying, you don't have to be a slave no longer. You can be a royal child of God. You just got to accept me in your life, the free gift. And you say, Pastor Mike, how do you receive that free gift? How do you walk in that freedom? How do you walk in that truth? The Bible says very simply, all you have to do with your mouth just say, forgive me. Jesus, forgive me. Come be a part of my life. I give you my life. You just say it. And then you believe it in your heart that he hears your prayers. Why? Because he's not rotting in a grave somewhere. He's the resurrected king sitting at the right hand of God. He sees you. He notices you. He hears you. And every time you pray, I guarantee you he's responding on your behalf. And so right now, if you're in this room, it's time you come back home. Don't run away from your God. Don't quit. Keep living like a slave. Start living like a child of God. So we're going to pray this prayer together as a family. I want everybody to bow your heads. Nobody looking around. Please, no moving. This is the most important thing we do, all service. And I want you to take your hand and place it over your heart. It's a symbol of your whole soul. And repeat after me, dear Jesus. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. And I believe your blood washes away all sins. Come be a part of my life. I am forgiven. I am chosen. I do matter. And today I give you my life. With every head bowed, I want nobody looking around. Holy Spirit, move. I pray right now, freedom starts rising up in them. I pray joy starts filling their heart. I pray peace calms their every nerve as you never leave them, you never forsake them, and when you say they are free, they are truly free, and when you say they are forgiven, they are truly 100% forgiven. With every head bowed, I want nobody looking around. If you made the commitment today for the first time, or you recommitted your life to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to do something very bold and brave. In just a second, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I do that for two reasons. One, I want to pray for you this week. And I like seeing that hand raised in our prayers. 
But secondly, and most importantly, this is not a time to be embarrassed. This is not a time to be scared or nervous. This is a time to be excited. You are a child of God. This is a time to tell that devil ain't got no more place in your life. And it's a time to join the party that's going on in heaven that you came home and let gratitude always be at the forefront of your heart and mind. So if you made that commitment for the first time or recommitted your life to Jesus on the count of three, I want to see hands all over this place raised. One, don't be afraid. Two, we going to celebrate three. Get your hands up right now. What's up, family? Man, I'm so excited that you just tuned in to one of the messages here at Bloom, and I hope it really blessed you. If you'd like to stay up with Bloom, you can follow us on all social media sites at Church Bloom. And if this was really a blessing to you and you want to continue to support our ministry and love to donate, you can go to bloomhere.org slash give or text the five-digit number listed right here below. Guys, we are blessed. Hope you tune in next time. I pray God's peace.